don't overestimate yourself, but don't underestimate who you could be. That's a much better way of thinking about it. You know, psychologists of the careless sort, I would say, have been pushing the idea of self-esteem for a very long time, probably since the early 60s. You should be content with yourself the way you are. It's like, no, you shouldn't. Seriously, like, you're nowhere near what you could be. You're not even close. Right? And so that's a, that's a way more optimistic message. Like, it's you ain't seen nothing yet. That's the right message. And so I would say, don't overestimate yourself now, but don't underestimate your future self. And you have so much influence as an individual, if you get your act together, that you can't believe it. There isn't anything that has more influence than that. You have all the power that there is right where you are to put things right around you. You start now, you develop a noble vision, right, of who you could be. You start to put that into practice, develop some discipline, familiarize yourself with the great works of the past. Learn to read, learn to write, learn to speak, learn to think. Man, you'll be deadly. What you could bring to the table that hasn't been brought to the table for years is an emphasis on individual responsibility. And the, the right way to do that, as far as I'm concerned, is to start with yourselves, is develop a vision for your life. You start to think about if you could be who you could be, what would that look like? That's the beginning of a mature philosophy of being. If you could be the person that you would admire, who would that person be? How would you configure yourself? How would you configure your career, your education, your family? Your, your the use of time outside of work, if you wanted to be the noblest person that you could be who was adopting the maximal amount of responsibility, how would that look? Then you need a strategy to put that into place. And that's the way you change things properly and also the way you do the least amount of harm while you're changing. And so it should be an individual, an individual focused set of ideas and that way you can sidestep the identity politics traps and that would be a very good thing and i think a modern conservatism which isn't really all that distinguishable from a classical liberalism as it turns out is to put tremendous stress on the responsibility of the individual and one of the things that's wonderful about that as far as i'm concerned and i made reference to this a few minutes ago is that you need a meaning to offset the tragedy of life Otherwise, you just suffer stupidly, and you tend to make people around you suffer the same way. The way that you find that meaning is by adopting as much responsibility as you can. And what's also so fascinating about that is, you know, you, you're, you're characterized by an indefinite potential. It isn't easy to understand exactly what that is, that potential. But, you know, it's what people call you on when they say, you know, you're not living up to your potential, whatever that is that potential will be called forth from you as a consequence of adoption of responsibility because it won't manifest itself unless you take on a load. You're not going to develop in all the ways you could develop unless you set yourself a serious challenge because it takes the challenge to pull that out of you and also to motivate you to rid yourself of all the weaknesses and, and personality flaws that you've accumulated across the years and to let those disappear and burn off you. you you need to load yourself up before the demands of life will be such that you will discipline yourself properly and a, a noble goal is a very good way of, of beginning that the truth of the matter is as far as i'm concerned that each of us has enough potential character power of character let's say if it's properly manifested to contend with that in a noble way and to rise above it and to transcend and, and to deal with it in, in large part because we can make the world a much better place than it is for each of us individually and for our families and for our community. And we can constrain the malevolence, at least in our own hearts, and, and perhaps have a positive effect on those around us as a consequence. And that actually does make things better, and we actually can do that. And that's where the meaning in life is to be found. And that meaning, you know, that goes along with the adoption of that kind of responsibility is actually the antidote to the suffering. 
You know that perfectly well because all of you need a reason to get out of bed in the morning, especially on a rough morning, you know, when things aren't going so well in your life. And there will be plenty of times when things aren't going so well in your life. And you still need a reason to get up and get moving and get out there. And if you have adopted the responsibility at an individual level to make things better, given how bad they are, if you've adopted the responsibility to make things better, then you have a reason to get up. And so one of the things that I've been stressing to people is that there's very little difference between the meaning in life that gives you fulfillment and that engages you in existence and the willingness to shoulder as much individual responsibility as you can possibly handle. Those are the same things. And that's a really useful thing to know. And you kind of know this, right? Everybody knows this because, first of all, if you're not living up to your responsibilities, even to take care of yourself, the probability that you're going to be ashamed of that at some level is extraordinarily high. And so your own soul tells you that you're in error, so to speak. But also, if you look at who you spontaneously admire, which is a good indication of where, where your value system really sits, you'll see that the people you admire are always people who take responsibility for themselves and responsibility for their family and responsibility for their community. Get your act together. You've got things to do in the world. The absence of your full being in the world leaves a hole that, that is filled by terrible things at minimum. So at minimum, you have an ethical responsibility to ensure that the world doesn't devolve into something approximating hell. And at maximum, you have the responsibility, again, the ethical, and it's a heavy ethical responsibility to do everything that's in your power to make things as good as you can possibly make them in this sophisticated manner that takes you and your family and your community into account. And it's on you, right? And that's meaning. You know, people say, well, I'd like to have a meaningful life. It's like, well, fair enough. But the, the price that you pay for the meaning that transcends tragedy is the adoption of responsibility for the catastrophe of existence. But that ennobles you, right? It makes you into someone strong and someone competent and someone who who's worthwhile, and who lives in a manner that justifies their own suffering. And that's what, there's nothing better than you could possibly do than that. Although there is a very large number of ways of looking at the world, or perhaps a near infinite number of ways of looking at the world, there isn't a near infinite number of ways of acting in the world in a manner that actually is successful. So, and so there are constraints on how you can, how you can interact with the world in a successful manner. Let's assume that you don't want undue pain and anxiety. We could just start with that. And I think that's a reasonable proposition. You can tolerate some pain and anxiety if it's in the service of something greater, obviously, but I just mean pointless pain and anxiety. We don't want any more of that than is necessary. And that means that you have to take care of yourself to some degree, but the manner in which you take care of yourself is severely constrained. This is partly what, why you have to be intelligent and careful and plot your way through life properly. You have to take care of yourself today, but you have to take care of yourself in, today in a way that doesn't interfere with you taking care of yourself tomorrow and next week and next month and next year and five years from now and ten years from now. So. You can't do just what you want to in the next hour, because if it's impulsive, pleasure-seeking, let's say, something like that, uh, excess alcohol use or excess drug use or careless sexual behavior or betrayal of people to, to gain, you some, gain you something in the moment, you're going to pay for that. You're going to pay for it tomorrow. You're going to pay for it next week and next month and next year. So because you're going to exist in the future and because you have to live with yourself, there's only a certain number of ways that you can act that are going to work. But it's more than that. It's not just that you're responsible to your future self or the set of all your future selves. It's that you also have to act in a way that works for your family because otherwise your family is going to disintegrate and break down and cause you and them all sorts of misery and grief. And 
and not just your family now, but also your family into the future. And then not just your family either, but also your community. And so you have to set your aspirations so that they serve you in the broadest sense over a long period of time. And they also serve your family and they also serve your community. And that's a very tight set of constraints. And I think that the best solution to that set of constraints from a philosophical perspective, or maybe even a theological perspective, is to view the world as a place not of groups, but of individuals, of sovereign individuals who are responsible for their destinies, responsible for their families and for their communities. You learn to use minimal necessary force. It's like you don't defend yourself any more than you have to. Like, be careful. Don't push any harder than you need to, because all you do is you generate a counterforce by by pushing harder than you need to, and then and then you're in conflict, and you think, well, I like a little conflict. It's like, look, fair enough, a little conflict, man, no problem. It keeps your life kind of interesting, and maybe that's on the problem solving edge. But a little conflict can become a lot of conflict very very rapidly, and if you have any sense at all, that's not what you want. You know, especially if you have... I call the course personality and its transformation. I think you could think about that as a restatement of the idea of being mm -hmm. and becoming. And that's what you are. You're, for whatever that means, you're an entity that both is and is transforming. And there, there's a rule that goes along with that, which is don't sacrifice who you could be for who you are. Which means if you have to choose to transform in a positive direction or maintain your current position, then it's better to transform in a positive direction. Who are you? You're the thing that transforms who you are. But on top of that, you're the thing that transforms who you are. You are the thing that is and you're the thing that becomes. And you should put the thing that becomes at a higher place than the thing that is. That means you also have to allow yourself to shake off those things about you that you might be pathologically attached to habits and people, for that matter, ways of thinking, all of those things, you have to allow yourself to shake those off. And that's more like a burning. And you might say, well, I don't know what I should leave behind. And the answer to that is that's a lie. You know some of the things that you should leave behind. You All you have to do is ask yourself. You'll come up with a list instantly of a 100 stupid things that you're doing that you know you could stop doing. Some of them maybe you don't know you could stop doing. It's like, well, fine, leave those alone for now. But there's a bunch of things you perfectly know well that you could stop doing that would improve your life. Everything that makes you anxious or everything that makes you upset is the same as every other thing that's ever made you upset. All those things that have made you upset that you've never dealt with, they're all laying down there at the bottom of your nasty little soul waiting to pop themselves up in some in some random utterance, right? And so then you go in there at your peril because if you're the person who pokes around in that, then you're going to get blasted with all of that stuff. It's going to come out like almost uncontrollably. And then, then you can sort it out. What's behind the game you're playing? And the answer to that is all the world that you're ignoring. Always. You're trying to do well in a class. And you get a bad grade. Why did I get this C minus? What is it? The answer is you don't know. Do you not know what you thought you knew? Are you not who you think you are? Do you not work hard enough? Are your values not organized properly? Do you misuse your time? Are you in the wrong field? Have, have, is the way you're construing your life completely inappropriate? Are you acting out what your parents wanted you to do it, and you're pissed off about it, so you're only running at 40% despite them, despite the fact that they're paying $25,000 a year for your education? When, you, when you're in the world and something objects to you, something that matters objects to you, then in the entire unrealized world is in that thing that objects. It's all tangled up inside it. That's why it's the great dragon of chaos. It's everything that's outside of your conceptual structure. And what is that? It's everything that lurks outside of your, of your walled city. Well, you get your C minus and you don't do anything about it. Maybe you're a little bitter and more resentful and your study habits get a little worse. So the next time you get like a D plus. And then you collect a bunch of Fs, and then you stop going to school, and then you stop showering, 
right? Then you end up jumping off the bridge. And so that's a that's that's how the dragon eats you when you don't pay attention to it. And so it's no bloody wonder that people avoid, you know. It's really no wonder that they avoid because error messages contain within them the implicit world. Now, the upside of that is, well, they contain within them the implicit world. And the world isn't all negative. The C- minus can be the best gift you ever had, and that's the gold that the dragon hoards. Right? That's exactly what that means. Every time you try to learn something, you're going to make a mistake, because what do you know? So you're going to make mistakes. And if the rule is every time you make a mistake, you're going to go jump off the bridge, then that's not a useful problem-solving strategy. And so when you make a mistake, you don't get to beat yourself to death with a club. You've got a problem. Something has objected to you. Then the question is, well, what does that mean? Well, maybe you're not looking at the world right. Maybe your goals are wrong. Maybe you're not acting properly. So, okay, so the question that arises when an obstacle emerges is, which part of this structure needs attention? And the first answer can't be all of it. Right? Because there's a piece that's broken somewhere. And then you might think, well, let's let's assume it's a little piece to begin with. That's the right mechanism. Watch the people around you like a hawk. Whenever they do something that you think is good, you tell them. Try to do something good. And creep right back into their persona. And they'll look around and see if anyone noticed. And sometimes they'll get punished for it. And then, well, then they won't do it again. So don't do that. But then. Now and then you think, hey, I saw you do this. It was actually, that was actually pretty good. I know you don't want to because you really want to dominate them and you don't, you don't want them thriving because then they'd be a, they'd be competition to you and you wouldn't be able to go complain to your mother about what a miserable partner you have. And you know how delightful that is. So you have to forego all that pleasure if you actually helped your person develop. So you got to get over all that. It's really annoying. Uh, it's dangerous because they might outshine you. Well, good. Then you'll have someone to compare yourself to. That'd be a good deal. It's really rough with kids, you know, because parents will stop their children from succeeding beyond them. They get jealous. And then they'll put them down. And then they have kids that do not like them. And they'll pay for it. If if you aren't suffering from self-imposed misery, and you're only suffering from inescapable misery, maybe you could handle that. And, you know, you could... You could survive, you could bear it, and and even maybe without becoming irredeemably corrupt. So the goal would be, well, yeah, life is a rat's nest of miseries, and maybe it has no ultimate meaning. We could say that if we're feeling particularly pessimistic, but it still leaves one question open, which is, if you didn't do everything you could to make it worse, how good could you make it be? And the, the least answer is, well, it, it could be tragedy, but maybe not hell. That's the most pessimistic proper statement. The worst case outcome in the worst of all possible worlds is that your life could be tragic, but not hell. You're at your mother's deathbed and all you, you and all your idiot siblings are arguing. Well, that's the difference between tragedy and hell. You walk away from a situation like that, sick of yourself and sick of everything else too. And you know, it's often the case that tragic circumstances bring out the dragons because the stress is high and all those things that people haven't dealt with, they don't have the energy to repress and, and all the bitterness comes pouring forward. If you were all gathered around the bed of someone close who was dying, could you manage it? And if the answer is no, it's like, well, put your life together because it's going to happen and you should be the person who's there that can do it and do it properly. And then maybe you'd find that it isn't the sort of thing that will undermine your faith in life itself. Don't want to be the thing that clings so desperately to the raft that you can't let go when someone comes to rescue you, right? You don't want to be that. So then you think, well, exactly what are you? You're not the chaos. You're not the plan. Maybe you're the thing that confronts the obstacle. And then when you know even further that the obstacle is not only an obstacle, but opportunity itself, are you so sure that this is a problem? Is that the only way that you can look at it? Or is it an opportunity? And 
maybe you're in the order and maybe you're in the chaos, but those can flip on you. And maybe you shouldn't be in either of those places. Maybe you should be right in the middle. That's when you go down, you see, when you're down in chaos and you don't know what the hell's going on, you have to rediscover the values that orient people, have oriented people forever. That's what you have to discover. So, for example, when I'm dealing with people who have post-traumatic stress disorder and they've usually encountered someone malevolent, they have to relearn the description of good and evil. Because if they don't, they have no framework. They're lost. They think, well, there's a malevolence afoot in the world. Because the only thing that a monster won't mess with is another monster. And you might say, well, I don't want to transform myself into a monster. It's like, you don't have a choice. You can either be a pathetic monster, or you can be a monster with some power. Those are your options. There's no non-monster alternative. Weak or strong. And I don't mean strong like dominating tyrant strength. That isn't what I mean at all. I mean strength like functioning at a funeral strength. And that's a kind of monstrosity. And when you're down in chaos, that's what you have to rediscover. You want to be safe? Forget that. That's not in the cards. You're not going to be safe. Well, then you have to be meta-safe. And that's way better, because then you're not safe, but you know how to cope with danger. Well, fine. <laughs> that solves the problem. And maybe it's even a better solution, because if you're safe, then you just have to stay in your burrow. But if you can confront danger, then you can go wherever you want and you can have an adventure. And maybe that's what you need to do is to go out and have an adventure. So you don't even want safety because how exciting is that? Let's say we made you perfectly safe. All that you had to do is eat cakes and worry yourself with the continuation of the species. What would you do? You'd smash it all down as soon as you possibly could, just so you had something interesting and challenging to do. So you don't want safety. You want to be able to cope with danger. That's a whole different thing. You don't get to be safe ever again. Well, so what happens? You get to be stronger. Well, hey, turns out that's a better bargain anyways. I read this, uh, this piece of work by Jung a long while back. and he, It was a meditation on the injunction to treat your neighbor as, as you would like to be treated. And what Jung pointed out, which I really liked, was that that wasn't an injunction to be nice to other people. It was an invitation to reciprocity. It was something like this. It's like, you should figure out how you would like to be treated, like you were taking care of yourself. It's like, imagine you had a child that you really cared for. And, and someone said, well, people will treat this child exactly like you want them to, but you have to figure out what that is. How do you want your child to be treated? You don't want everyone just to be nice to him. You know, you want people to challenge him and you want people to discipline him and you want people to tell him when he's wrong. It's like, you don't just want everyone to be nice. That's, that's pathetic. It's pathetic. There's, there's no challenge in that. You want to treat other people like you would like to be treated. Well, then you have to figure out how would you like to be treated? And while you'd like people to fawn all over you and just lay everything at your feet, it's like, no. That's, that's not something you'd wish for for someone that you were taking care of. Then there's an additional problem, which is it's often the case that people will treat other people better than they treat themselves. It's a bit of a meditation on why people don't like themselves very much. I think there's two reasons, really, and one is that we're, we're fragile and damageable and imperfect in multiple dimensions all the time. And that often just gets worse. It gets lots of things get worse as you get old, for example. So it's not necessarily that easy for a self-conscious being who's extraordinarily aware of his or her own fragility and, but not just fragility, uh, foolishness and errors. His, like, you know yourself better than anyone else knows you. And you might have a certain amount of uh, dislike for someone you know because of something they did. But you know everything you did. Jesus, that's a drag, man. You know, you have to carry that along behind. It's like, really, I did that, you know? You're weak and kind of useless and prone to temptation. And you know all those things, you know, that just shouldn't be that way. And then you're also capable of pretty vicious acts of malevolence. And so you also know that about yourself. And so it's a real existential question for people. It's like, why the hell should you take care of something as sorry and wretched as you are? 
despite the fact that you're not all that you could be, the proper attitude to have towards yourself is the attitude that you would have towards someone that you genuinely cared for, and that it's incumbent on you to act as if you genuinely care for yourself, just like you would act towards someone that you actually cared about, some other person. It's a reversal in some sense of the golden rule, right? And it's a discussion of why that's necessary. And also, more than that, it's a discussion of why, why you have a moral obligation to do that. It's not just that you should because it would be better for you. It's You actually have a moral obligation to do that, I think, because you make the world a much worse place if you don't take care of yourself. So you should bloody well take care of yourself, you know? It's partly because you have something valuable to bring into the world. That's the thing about being an individual. It's the thing that Western civilization has always recognized, that as an individual, you have a light that you have to bring into the world. And that if you don't bring it into the world, the world is a dimmer place. And that's a bad thing, because when the world is a dim place, it can get very, very, very dark. You need to take care of yourself because you're in the best position to do that. And it's necessary for you to take care of yourself. Despite the fact that we're mortal and vulnerable and self-conscious and capable, not only capable of doing terrible things, but actually do them. Despite all that, you, you're still, you still have that responsibility. I wanted to, you know, hit the question as hard as I can to try to figure out, well, why people are, have, are contemptuous of themselves. And there's plenty of reason, that's for sure. But the reasons do not justify the mistreatment of yourself. Make friends with people who want the best for you. And that's a meditation on my own childhood and adolescence to some degree. I, I had friends who wanted the best for me and friends who didn't. And like you have an ethical responsibility to take care of yourself, you have an ethical responsibility to surround yourself with people who have the courage and, and faith and wisdom to wish you well when you've done something good and to stop you when you're doing something destructive. And if your friends aren't like that, then they're not your friends. Be careful about whom you share good news with. A friend is someone you can share good news with, you know. You go to them and you say, hey, look, this good thing happened to me. And, th and they say, look, I'm so happy that that happened to you. Like, way to be. And they don't think, God damn it, why didn't that happen to me? And like, you know, you didn't deserve it. Here's a bunch of reasons you're stupid and why it won't work. It's like, that's not helpful. You know, the other thing people are doing, if they're trying to drag you down, let's say, is they're trying to see if you'll put up with it. Because they have this idea that maybe life isn't worth living and things aren't good. And that if they can be smirched, let's say, to use an archaic term, something that's pristine and good, then they demonstrate to themselves that there is no true ideal and that there's no necessary reason to be responsible and to strive forward. There is inequality. What that means is there's always going to be people around that are better at something than you are. And the, and that's a, that's a problem because you can get jealous and you can get bitter and you can get resentful. And worse, you can get hopeless. You need an ideal because you have nothing to aim at, but an ideal is a judge and you always fall short of the ideal. So how the hell can you have the benefits of having an ideal without having the crushing blow that goes along with having the judge that always regards you as insufficient. You need a goal, but we don't want to let your distance from the goal crush you. So you got to set up a goal and then you got to make the goal, break the goal down into parts so that you can move towards it and you have a fairly high likelihood of doing it. So that, that's a bit, bit of practical I wouldn't say advice, because it's better than advice. It's, it's some practical knowledge about how to go about achieving an aim. Set a high aim, but differentiate it down so you know what the next step is. And then make the next step difficult enough so you have to push yourself past where you are, but, but also provide yourself with a reasonable probability of success. You really have to stop comparing yourself in some ways to other people. 
And the reason for that is that the particularities of your life are so idiosyncratic that there isn't anyone really all that much like you, you know, because the details of your life happen to matter. And so maybe you compare yourself to some rock star or something like that. And, you know, the person's rich and famous and glamorous and all that, but, you know, they're alcoholic and they use too much cocaine and they've had three divorces. And it's like, how the hell do you make sense out of that? Is that someone that you should judge yourself harshly against or not? The answer is you don't know because you don't know all the details of their lives. And who do you know that you can compare yourself to? That's easy. You. Yesterday. Compare yourself to who you were yesterday, not to who someone else is today. So here's a good goal. It's something like, well, aim high, but use as your control yourself. So your goal is to make today some tiny increment better than yesterday. And you can use better. You can define better yourself. This doesn't have to be some imposition of external morality. You know, you know where you're weak and insufficient, where you could improve. Think, okay, well, this is what I'm like yesterday. If I did this little thing, things would be just a, an increment better. That's a great thing because you get the ball rolling and incremental improvement is unstoppable. You can actually implement it, and it starts to generate Pareto distribution-like consequences. It starts to compound. Then you have your goal, and then you think, well, I need to move towards that incrementally because I'm kind of useless and can only do so much and maybe not even that. And, but all I have to do is be a little bit better than my, my miserable self yesterday. To listen to your resentment is one of the best things you can possibly do. You have to admit that it exists first, and then you have to admit to the fantasies that it's generating, and you have to admit to what you would regard as the way out of it. So that's all very difficult because it means learning things about yourself that you probably don't want to learn. But resentment only means one of two things. It means either like shut the hell up, grow up, quit whining, and get on with it. That's one thing it means. Or someone is playing the tyrant to you, might even be you. You have something to say and do that you should say and do to put it to a stop. One of the general rules of thumb about how to be successful is to confront things that frighten you forthrightly and with courage. The goal should be, how could I conceive of my life so that if I had that life, it would clearly be worth living so I wouldn't have to be bitter, resentful, deceitful, arrogant, and vengeful? Like, that's sort of the bottom line, right? Because that's what endless failure does to you. It's not good. That's what life without purpose and a goal does to you as well, because life is very hard. So you think, okay, well, I need to adopt a mode of being that would justify my suffering. And you can ask yourself that question. What would make this worthwhile? There's this old idea that you go into the abyss. It's an idea that you can gaze into the abyss. You gaze long. And what you find in the abyss is a monster. That's the dragon at the bottom of the abyss, let's say. That's Satan himself, for that matter. But if you go into that, into that as deeply as you can, what you find is you find your fragmented father in a in a comatose condition in a desiccated and and separated condition and then you revivify that well what does that mean it means something well, it means that if you look in the darkness you find the light that's one thing it means and that the light really stands out against the darkness but that the light is to be found in the darkness so that's a very interesting thing that's a quest narrative but it means more than that. It means something fundamental. So we know, for example, that if you take yourself out of your current state of predictability and safety, and you put yourself in a new situation, you'll learn, right? You'll incorporate new information. So that's a cognitive issue. But that isn't all that happens. What happens is that new genes turn on within you and code for the production of new proteins. And that happens neurologically. New parts of you turn on. And so the idea is that if you can move yourself out into the world and push yourself out against a maximum array of challenges, more and more of you turn on. 
turns on. And, to, and then the question would be, well, what would you be if all of you that could be turned on was turned on? And the answer would be, you would be the resurrection of the ancestral father. That's what you would be. And so that's why Christ says, I am the way and the truth and the life. And no one comes to the father except through me. What that means is that if you take on the unbearable burden of being voluntarily, then that transforms you into the ancestral father. And that's true. And so that's unbelievably optimistic. It's so interesting because it's, it's dark beyond belief. While well, the world is characterized by suffering and by malevolence of a depth that's virtually beyond comprehension. But if you choose to comprehend that, what you discover in that is the light that destroys the darkness. And that's, well, that's, and that's really something to discover. It's, there isn't a discovery that's more profound than that. That's the search for the Holy Grail or the Philosopher's Stone, all of that. If you actually want something, you can have it. Now, the question then would be, well, what do you mean by actually want? And the answer is that you reorient your life in every possible way to make the probability that that will occur as certain as possible. And that's a sacrificial idea, right? It's like, you don't get everything. Obviously, you, obviously. But maybe you can have what you need. And maybe all you have to do to get it is ask. But the asking isn't a whim or, or today's wish. It's like, you have to be deadly serious about it. You have to think, okay, like I'm taking stock of myself. And if I was going to live properly in the world and I was going to set myself up such that being would justify itself in my estimation, and I don't mean as a harsh judge, exactly what is it that I would aim at? You could try this. This is a form of prayer, knocking. Sit on your bed one day and ask yourself, what remarkably stupid things am I doing on a regular basis to absolutely screw up my life? And if you actually ask that question, but you have to want to know the answer, right? Because that's actually what asking the question means. It doesn't mean just mouthing the words. It means you have to decide that you want to know. You'll figure that's out so fast it'll make your hair curl. But you're perfectly capable of thinking. God only knows how. You're perfectly capable of, of immense feats of imagination and, and dream and fantasy. It's God only knows how you do all of that. What would happen if you consulted yourself about the best possible outcome for you? You might get an answer. In order for us to set things right, we have to understand that we, we have to take on that burden of ultimate responsibility. Not only as if it's ours, which it is, but as if there isn't anything better that we could do. And you have an ethical obligation to lift the heaviest load you can possibly conceive of. And that's the primary call to adventure in life. You need a meaning in your life to forestall the suffering and to make you strong enough to resist malevolence. Where's the meaning to be found? Rights, impulsive pleasure and happiness. No. Responsibility. Oh, who would have guessed that? It, it's not part of the narrative. What makes life worth living is to pick up, take its catastrophe and embrace it and carry it and to realize through that process who you are. When I talk to audiences about the relationship between responsibility and meaning, they inevitably go dead silent. There's not a, there's not a rustle. There's not a cough. It's like, is that the secret? Is that the secret? Is that it's the voluntary adoption of responsibility? It's like, well, that's the, that's the central message of the West. It's like to pick up your cross and bear it, you know, and everyone's been told that, but they don't know what it means because it's not been articulated enough so that it becomes something that's practical. It's like, yes, look at the terrible responsibilities you have right in front of you. Your family is hurting. You're in trouble. There's problems in the world. It's like all of that's right there. 
And all you have to do is, all you have to do is take responsibility for it. And then you've got what you need. It's something so magnificent that happiness pales in comparison. And so it's, it's, it's thin gruel happiness. And young people know that. They're pursuing hedonistic pleasure. And you know, no wonder. But there's nothing in it that's sustaining. And all it does is make you cynical. It's like, is that all there is? Another one night stand? Another, another binge party? You know, and it's not like I have anything against, in principle, against some of that exuberant, youthful hedonism. Look, the universities have turned into places of parties. Why? Well, because that's what the students find best to do there. Well, that's not good. What you want to offer them is a reason to not party. It's like, no, you got to understand, you come to this class hungover. You're not going to be able to get it. You're not going to be able to write properly. You're going to pay a price for that hedonism. It's like, and the price will be too high for you to bear. It's like, oh, well, enough hedonism for me then. Like, I've got something important to do. That's the way out of that. Before you can be a painter who can paint what's beyond mere memory, you, you have to inculcate that discipline skill. And a lot of that is painful repetition and hard grinding work it's the sacrifice of the present for the future but once you manage that then things open up that's why we have disciplines right i mean the words aren't there by accident you have to narrow yourself first and then you can broaden outward and so that's and that's part of the process of maturation now that's part of the sacrifice of childhood say in childhood, you're nothing but potential, but it's not realized and you don't know how to realize it. And so then the question is, well, how do you get to a point where you realize the potential? And the answer is you sacrifice almost all of it to a single direction. And so that's the thing about growing up is that when you're a teenager and a young adult, you have to sacrifice everything you could have been as a child to be the one thing that you're aiming at. But then that opens up. Everyone in their right mind knows that there's a million ways of doing things wrong and one way, if you're lucky, to do things right. And so the notion that it's a, a very, very narrow pathway that you tread upon if you're doing things right, that's wisdom. That's the line between chaos and order that you're supposed to be on constantly, right? It's a very, very thin line because if you're a little bit too far in one direction, then it's too much chaos. And if you're a little too far in the other direction, then it's too much order. And both of those aren't good. It has to, the balance has to be exactly right. And you can feel that. And I truly believe you can feel that. And I think it's your deepest instinct. It's your deepest instinct. And I mean that, I mean that biologically. I don't mean that metaphorically. I think that your psyche is arranged to exist in a cosmos that's composed of chaos and order. I think that's why you have the hemispheric structure that you have. And then when you feel as if you're meaningfully engaged in the world, when the terror of your mortality strips away and you're engaged and it's timeless, that's the deepest instinct you have telling you that you're in the right place at the right time. And then what you do is practice being there, practice being there. And that's that, that narrow spot that's so difficult to find. You wander around it. Maybe if you're lucky, you can watch. You can watch. This is an experiment. Watch yourself for two weeks like you don't know who you are because you don't. So watch yourself for two weeks. And notice there's going to be times when things are proper. They're arrayed properly for you. you it, it's not easy to notice because when they're arrayed like that, you're so engaged, you you don't exactly notice, you know, but you'll see, oh, I'm in the right place. It's like, okay, how'd I get here? What am I doing right? You know, how, how is it that this could happen more often? I'd like this to happen more often. How would I have to conduct myself in order for that to happen more often? And then you practice that. And then maybe instead of 10 minutes a month or 10 minutes a week, it's like 15 minutes a day. And then it's half an hour a day. And then it's an hour a day. And then it's four hours a day. And maybe if you're if you're extraordinarily careful, then you get to a point where you're like that a good proportion of the time. Rule one is 
stand up straight with your shoulders back. And it's about a general attitude towards life. So hierarchies are very uh, stable features of of life in general and certainly of human life. And wherever you have any system of values, you have a hierarchy because a system of values implies that one thing is better than another. If you have a situation where one thing is better than another, then some people are better at doing it than others, and you get a hierarchy. To stand up straight with your shoulders back is a literal injunction, but also a metaphorical injunction, because what you do when you stand up like that is you kind of expose the vulnerable surfaces of your body. It's an act of courage. It's an act of it's an act of taking on the voluntary responsibility of contending with hierarchical organization and uncertainty. And it's a very good, it's a good physical manifestation of the moral courage that's necessary to live life properly. And it's something that leaders naturally embody. And that's true not only of human beings, by the way, it's, it's also true of animals all the way down the biological chain. So the more successful creatures, let's say, are also those who comport themselves in an upright manner. And, you know, even in our common language, to be upright is not only something that we think about physically, but also morally, right? To be an upright person is to tell the truth and to act forthrightly and to do what you say you're going to do and all of those things. So that's all of a piece. And so that's rule one. Rule two, which is treat yourself like you're someone responsible for helping. That's an extension of rule one in some sense. The idea would be that, you know, people are often ashamed and embarrassed and anxious because of their insufficiencies and failures and, and, and the incomplete nature of their characters and, and all the things they don't know and all of that. And so, it's useful to to um, develop and practice uh, an ethic of detached self-regard. Like it's not narcissism. It's not self-esteem. It's 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 not grandiosity. It's none of that. It's just the clear realization that as other people have value and as it's necessary to treat them that way, if you want anything in your relationships whatsoever to go right, so it's also necessary to develop that attitude towards yourself, despite the knowledge you have of all your inadequacies. And that's a really good thing to practice because it requires practice, both the detachment and then that ethic of care. So, and then, you want to act in accordance with your highest values. Now, that means you have to figure out what those values are. If you act in accordance with your highest values, sometimes that makes your day-to-day -day operations difficult because you have to confront unpleasant truths. You have to discuss things that you'd rather avoid. It would be easier to act to decrease conflict in the moment. But it's a very bad medium to long-term strategy. You have to engage in a certain amount of conflict moment to moment if you're going to say and do the things that are necessary in order to set things right in the medium to long-term and for an increasingly large number of people. And that's also another guide to leadership, I would say. You need a broad-scale vision. You have to know what it is that you're doing with your life, let's say, generally speaking, but more particularly in the next three to five years. What do you want? What do you want from your friends, your family, your intimate relationships, your employment, your education, your care of your mental and physical health, your response to temptations like drug and alcohol use? If you could have what you wanted, if you could lay your life out properly, how would you be functioning across those seven dimensions? Why would that work for you? Why would it work for your family? And why would it work for the broader community? Then that gives you a reason, a reason. And 
if you have a reason that's well thought through, that you find compelling, so that's a compelling story, let's say, the kind of compelling story a leader might tell, then that will provide you with motivation to do the things that are difficult that you need to do. So that's positive emotion, that motivation. It's a neurochemical system that runs on the chemical dopamine. It's the neurochemical system that underlies people's willingness to undertake something voluntarily. So we experience most positive emotion in relationship to a goal. And what that means is if you don't have a goal, then you don't have any motivation. And so what that means is you better have your goals well delineated. Because that way you'll be maximally motivated. Now, the additional advantage to that is that if you have your goals delineated and they're compelling goals for you, it also makes you less anxious and uncertain and stressed because the, your pathway forward into the future is mapped and that makes it more certain and uncertainty causes stress and, and physiological uh, load. Okay, so. You want to have your large-scale vision. You want to have it thought out on a three- to five-year basis. You want to have it cover those seven or so dimensions that we already described. You want to see how why it's relevant to you and your family and the broader community. You want to break that down into your monthly, weekly, and daily practices. And if they can be routinized, then so much the better. And then that becomes built into you. So what happens neurologically is that when you do something new, you use almost your whole brain. That's a good way of thinking about it, particularly the right side of it, the right hemisphere. And as you practice something, the amount of your brain you use gets smaller and smaller until and moves leftward until you basically build a effective little machine at the back that takes care of it automatically. Routinizing things decreases the cognitive and physiological load. It's a big deal. And if you routinize good habits, then they become part of your character. And part of what people come to expect of you. To be precise in your speech does two things. It specifies your goal. And it reduces uncertainty. You see what you aim at. And I don't mean that metaphorically. I really don't. Because you're a lot more blind than you think. You, there's a lot of the world that you don't see. You see most of what's in front of you in a very blurry way, like your peripheral vision is extremely low resolution. You see clearly a tiny focal area that, that's where you're pointing your eyes. And so, and you point your eyes at what you want to pay attention to. And what you want to pay attention to is generally associated with what you want. So what that means is that the world reveals itself to you in relationship to what you want. And so that's really helpful because you you want to see the world so you don't stumble blindly through it and fall into a pit. You want to get to where you're going. And so if you specify where you're going very clearly, then that enables you to see the pathway forward. Now, the upside to that is that you can probably get to where you want to go. The downside is you also make your conditions of failure very explicit. And that's hard on people in the short term. You know, it's it's easy to delude yourself and to leave everything vague because then you can't tell when you're failing. But that doesn't stop you from failing. It just stops you from seeing it while it's happening. Then the other advantage to being precise in your speech and your aims is that that helps you tell the difference between what's important and what isn't important. And you want almost everything to be not important. You know, in times of crisis in your life, everything becomes important. So imagine that you have a, a new physical symptom that's distressing and you don't understand it. So then you're thinking, oh my God, what's happening? Am I collapsing physically? Am I, have I got a serious illness? Is it a fatal illness? What's going to happen to my family? Is my whole life going to fall apart? Like what happens when, when something that you can't specify occurs is that everything becomes relevant. And that's terrible. No one 
No one ever wants that. You want hardly anything to be relevant. And so if you specify your goal, then almost everything becomes irrelevant. And only those things that are important stand up in sharp, in sharp relief. That's also a real boon to the people that you're communicating with because they know what you want then. And so they, even if you're a harsh person, let's say that you're pretty punitive and if people don't do a good job, you, you know, you let them know. If you specify what you want, then they know how to avoid your harshness. And the more precise you are in your formulation of the problem and in your presentation of a solution and the role you might play in that solution, the more likely you are to advance on all fronts. As far as I can tell, there's nothing you can do that moves you and your agenda, your vision, let's say, forward faster than precision in speech. What's the meaning of life? I think the meaning is to be found in that. And, and as, you, as you put things together, and as you take responsibility for things, the meaning emerges from that. And so it emerges from that the same way it emerges from a symphony in some sense, you know, because a symphony is composed of layers of patterns and they're all working harmoniously together. And they speak directly to people of meaning, which is why people love music so much. I mean, every form of music does that. And that it's a model for proper being, which is the, the, the placing of all the different la- levels of reality into harmonious relationship with one another. And meaning emerges out of that naturally. And meaning is actually an instinct. This is another thing that people don't understand, and it's a case I've been able to make because I, I, I know a fair bit about how the brain works. The two, the twin hemispheres of your brain interact to guide you through life, well, which is a truism in some sense. You use your brain to guide you through life, but your brain does that fundamentally by instilling the, the proper things that you do with a sense of meaning. And that meaning is, it's not something that's just a surface it's, it's not on the surface of the world in some sense it's the deepest instinct that you have it's associated with a phenomenon that russian neuropsychologists discovered back in the 1960s called the orienting reflex and the orienting reflex is what orients you towards things of interest right. and that happens unconsciously and so if something happens around you that's of significance often something you don't expect say something somewhat chaotic you orient towards it, and that attracts your attention. And then as you investigate what that is, that's associated with a sense of meaning. And if you put what you're investigating into proper order, then that meaning continues to reveal itself. So you can use meaning as a guide to proper being. But you have to also be very careful to conduct yourself honestly if you're going to do that, because if you conduct yourself dishonestly, then you pathologize the mechanisms that orient you Everybody is a strange mixture of victim and victimizer. Lots of terrible things happen to people that aren't justifiable in some sense. You know, well, illness strikes people randomly. I mean, not entirely randomly, obviously, but there's a very, there's a large random element in it. Where you're thrown into existence as a consequence of your birth, that's that you're sort of thrown into reality with your particular set of predispositions and weaknesses and and then there's going to be times in your life where things twist in a manner that's unfair to you that you're not getting your just desserts but that goes along with all sorts of unequally distributed privileges as well and so that's the arbitrary nature of existence and but but you can't allow those sorts of things to define you because it's not it's not that useful strategically when you're playing a card game, you're dealt a, you're dealt a hand of cards. Well, what do you do? You play the hand the best you can. Why? Because all the hands are equal? No. Because you don't have a better strategy than playing the hand that you're dealt the best you can. And that doesn't even mean it'll be a winning strategy. But because... People don't always win. Sometimes we lose, and sometimes we lose painfully, and sometimes we lose painfully and unjustly. Mm. That's not the point. The point is you don't have a better strategy, and neither does anyone else. And 
then it's also not so obvious how privilege and victimization are distributed. You know, it, if you take someone who's doing quite well in life and you scratch underneath the surface, you generally don't have to scratch very far until you find one or more profound tragedies of the past or perhaps of the present. You know, and no matter how well protected you are in the world, you're still subject to 